Tonight on KQED Newsroom, Speaker Nancy Pelosi's husband is in the hospital after being attacked in his own home by a man with a hammer. We explore what happened and why. And California's congressional races could make all the difference in who wins the House of Representatives. Will economic concerns tip the scales? We consider politics and money in the Golden State. Plus, Musk's takeover of Twitter with our panel of reporters. And in the wake of the Bay Area's biggest earthquake in years, we talk with the developer of an app that warned residents nearly 20 seconds before the quake hit. Coming to you from KQED headquarters in San Francisco this Friday, October 28th, 2022. Hello and welcome. This is KQED Newsroom and I'm Priya David Clemens. There was a shocking attack at Speaker Nancy Pelosi's San Francisco home this morning. An intruder assaulted Speaker Pelosi's husband while reportedly calling out, where's Nancy? The suspect is in custody and Paul Pelosi, who is 82 years old, is expected to recover. Meanwhile, with Election Day less than two weeks away, Republicans are gaining momentum in congressional elections across the state. Inflation and the economy are top issues for many voters who are concerned about high gas and food prices as well as a lack of economic stability. Joining me now to discuss these intertwined political and economic issues are political analyst and former senior political writer for Politico, Carla Marinucci, and San Francisco Bureau Chief of Market Watch, Jeremy Owens. Thank you both for being here. We need to start with this horrific incident at the Pelosi home this morning here in San Francisco. Carla, you've covered the Pelosi's for a long, long time. What are you hearing about what happened and uh, the suspect who's in custody? I mean, what we know is uh, an attacker who came in early morning uh, a hammer attack on Paul Pelosi. Apparently security was with the speaker, Nancy Pelosi, who was not in San Francisco. That's kind of a shocking uh, aspect of this uh, attack. But we know that uh, police came in in the middle of the attack. The suspect is under arrest. Pelosi is hospitalized and apparently has undergone some kind of surgery. So at this point, very concerning. And I think, you know, look, we're two weeks away from an election mm -hmm. that has been conducted in some of the most toxic well, rhetoric that we've seen this, in our lifetime, I this think. This is a horrific incident, right. but it's not isolated in the sense of the rise in domestic violence and domestic terrorism, political violence. Carla, you have been pointing to this and bringing this up over and over again recently. That's right. I mean, we have seen uh, in this election cycle uh, just heated rhetoric, uh, more and more intimidation of voters and of elected officials and of uh, p folks who are volunteering to watch the vote. And elected officials like State Senator Scott Weiner have undergone threats. Gavin Newsom, uh, certainly Nancy Pelosi. Uh, the California Democratic Party headquarters was bombed. I mean, uh, we have a situation where the heated rhetoric, much of it on social media, mu much of it has been fueled by that, mm -hmm. uh, has just ramped it up to a point where I think we're, we're watching polls that are showing, uh, at least an NBC poll showed, 81% of Republicans think if they vote for a Democrat, it will be a danger to democracy. And likewise, Democrats feel the same. The partisanship is out of control. Well, surprisingly, when Elon Musk now took over Twitter as of yesterday, he is saying that he's doing this in order to restore sort of civility in communication. Let's put up a quote of what he said about why he acquired Twitter. He says, it is because it is important to the future of civilization to have a common digital town square where a wide range of beliefs can be debated in a healthy matter without healthy manner without resorting to violence, there is currently great danger that social media will splinter into far right-wing and far left-wing echo chambers that generate more hate and divide our society. Jeremy, I'm going to ask you to weigh in here. What are your thoughts on Musk taking over Twitter, how it may impact free speech, and what's happening on that platform? Well, he went on in that note to talk about how advertisers do not want to be advertising in a bio pit of hate, basically, that, that Twitter could become if he lets it become that. So I think that that note that he sent out was actually a good thing, but who knows, right? Elon says a lot of things. They can be contradictory, right? And, and we don't know, but now that he has full control, he, that is going to be, it's no longer theory. Right now we are seeing practice. And, and that note was interesting. I mean, it, it might've been written by uh, uh, Twitter's chief customer officer. Remember, Twitter's customers are advertisers, not its users, right? So if he wants this to succeed, he has to 
maintain a place where they want to be and where enough users want to be that advertisers want to be there. Well, he stepped in and immediately chopped off the top executives, right? <laughs> Which he still has not told employees. We still have no confirmation, official confirmation from Twitter, and neither do Twitter's employees have official confirmation that its chief executive is fired, mm -hmm. that its chief financial officer is fired, that its head of legal is fired. Listen, right? when he walked in with a sink <laughs> and said, I'm here, let that sink in, right? You know you're in a different era at a different time. And there, but, and there are so many questions about what he's going to do now. Is he going to let Donald Trump back on the, on the platform? or many of the other uh, folks who have used the term crazy Nancy, et cetera, firing up some of that rhetoric. Right, right. But again, like what he says has no basis in reality sometimes. So it's really hard. But what we do know is that he's dumping $44 billion, probably maybe four or five times what Twitter is actually worth into downtown San Francisco, into those employees' pockets, right? Twitter pays with stock compensation. So a lot of these employees are going to get paid out, right? They may get fired, but they'll get some money on the way out the door. And, and you know, with our economy, in the way it is now and, and the way it's trending, it's great to get that $44 billion into here and any other billionaires who want to overpay <laughs> for middling tech companies, come on down, like we've got plenty of them, you know? The, the tech companies had their earnings reports this week and they did not all do well here. This no, is not going I, well, but Meta really made head headlines. Meta was horrible, um, you know, and, and but they're spending and that's really the problem. I mean, it's good for the Bay Area economy that Google hired 13, nearly 13,000 people in the third quarter. It it may not be great for Google, right? It's it's great that that <laughs> Mark Zuckerberg is spending billions of dollars to build a metaverse, right? But it may not be that great for Meta, right? In, in the long term, so we're gonna see what happens. Um, but we did lose four hundred billion dollars in market cap just this week from the five largest tech companies um, in, in the world, um, and, and we've seen what looks to be the end of this big explosion that has happened since the last recession, right? In in, in cloud computing, in mobile. We seem to have at least hit a plateau. But when it comes to Elon Musk, look, this is a guy who has employed 30,000 people in California. His footprint is big in this state. So what he does is going to matter to the economy, especially of the Bay Area here. Uh, right, and it's not just Elon Musk, it is Zuckerberg. It, it, it is the Google guys, right? Like they are going to determine where we head from here. And so far they have continued hiring. They have continued spending, right? But now they're gonna get a lot of pushback from Wall Street. Well, and right? so there's been some news this week as well that California is rising economically, that we're going, that we're poised to go from being the fifth largest economy in the world to the fourth. Governor Newsom was very happy to share right. that news this week. That's right. He has bragging rights on this, uh, and, and I think it, it brings to the forefront economy is the issue as we go into these midterms. Uh, you know, when we look back a couple of months back, it was the Dobbs decision, it was abortion, uh, it was major shootings like the Uvalde shooting. That was firing up the Democrats. Now we're back to it's the economy, stupid. Uh, Gavin Newsom can talk about some of the good things that are going on in California, but the fact is California still is the poster child for uh, for the conservative right and Fox News when it comes to Which, some of the issues. Which, if those people are budget-minded right. and economy-minded, I don't see how they're attacking us, right? California's economy is doing better than the U.S. economy overall. Mm -hmm. It's doing much better than European mm -hmm. economies, right? But there there is, going, you know, a little bit of worry about the years ahead, right? The reason our budget was over by $100 billion last year was because of yeah. all the IPOs, right? And we're not getting IPOs this year. We're not, you know, the, the venture capital is still coming to the Bay Area more than any other place in the United States or the world, but there's less venture capital going out there right now. And, and if we're going to see a different, a different era in technology than what we have seen over the past decade plus, then California is gonna feel that. Um, and we're gonna see how that goes. So let's talk about how those economic concerns are really playing out on the campaign trail because we are coming up very close to the election here. Absolutely. And Carla, Democrats are worried that they are gonna lose control of the House, certainly. This has been a concern for a long time, but as you're saying, they sort of peaked a little while ago. That's and right. Uh, there, a lot of the like polls are shifting. Now. That's right. A lot of the polls are showing that it, w that Democratic advantage that we saw in the summer has faded, and the economy is front and center. Uh, in California, we thought, well, maybe we could be immune to this because this is a solidly blue state. It looks like Democrats are no. Right now, California is the center of the action in a lot of ways for the House races that are going to determine 
who holds the Iron Throne, which is the speakership. So it's, tell us which ones you're watching. Right. Which, which uh, ones are you concerned two about? Two in the Central Valley uh, and, and two in Southern California that are really considered toss-ups. And we're talking about David Valadeo, one of the, uh, the only uh, California Republican who voted in favor of impeachment of Donald Trump. Uh, Mike Garcia is another one, both of these most vulnerable Republicans uh, in northern Los Angeles County who won his seat by 333 votes. Uh, both of those are on the edge. In the 13th congressional district, we've got a new congressional district. Democrats want to take that with Adam Gray, but they've got a Republican challenger who is really making a play for that district. And you've got Mike Levin, one of the Democrats who won one of the seats in 2020 in a blue wave. He's now uh, in danger because of redistricting. So uh, one other person who's maybe in danger too is Katie Porter. Katie Porter, who, who is a yeah. darling of the Democrats. Da darling of the Democrats, huge fundraiser. Yeah. And she's in Orange County. Yeah, right, uh, it, yeah. Democrats right. don't win Orange County. Yeah, it's yeah. amazing that she won, and, and so she's gonna have to fight real hard to keep that. So so we get 10 seats all, all together in California that are really up in the air, and uh, this is where the speakership of the House could come down. So, so do the math for us here. How many seats do Republicans the Republicans need, just need to win? Five just five to get the Iron Throne. So uh, Kevin McCarthy is uh, pushing this big time. And that's where Nancy Pelosi was this week uh, w during this attack. She was out raising money uh, and she's so successful at it for the Democratic cause. Okay, let's uh, turn to the debate that we had here at KQED just a few days ago. This is the only debate that happened between Governor Newsom and his challenger, Brian Dolly. And during that debate, one of the questions that was posed was, Hey, Governor Newsom, are you really going to be sticking around? Are you going to be here for four years? Because his national profile has been so high. So let's listen to that and then come chat about him. You were asking voters for four more years. Do you commit to serving all four? Yes. This is a serious moment in American history, California history. Their zemanization, their demeaning of the gay and lesbian, bisexual and transgender community. I've had enough. So I'll proudly and happily stand up. What you don't do is stand up to big oil and these big interests. California has moved in a different direction. We now have six times more clean tech jobs, clean jobs, than we do fossil fuel jobs. This is the next great opportunity and economic uh, benefit for Californians and Americans, and we want to seize on that opportunity. I want to be clear, and though. And we are not interested in outsourcing those jobs. We want to dominate in this clean energy I just want to be space. clear, that was a yes on four more years. Yes. All right, what do y'all think? I mean, Gavin Newsom for his entire political career has been a great political chess player, looking 10 moves down the line to see whether it's issues or whether it's his own advancement up the ranks. Uh, I think he's building his political brand right now with, uh, with efforts around the country, taking on other governors, being that liberal lion, that voice that Democrats like to hear, punching it out with other uh, governors, not afraid to do so. And I think he's doing it with uh, real calculations in mind. He can say all he wants, oh, I'm not interested. But in the future, we know how that plays out. With many politicians, they go, but the people wanted me. So uh, th that can change. Right, but his, his future ambitions are going to be determined by how California goes in the next yes, couple of years. If yes. he wins the governorship again, which we believe he will, so I, I think where see, California Jeremy? heads yeah. is, is going to determine this. And again, like when we don't have as many IPOs, there's less money coming in, there's less to do. Is he going to then turn around and attack tech more? He has not been big about going after technology companies knowing that we need that to keep the economy going in California. But we have in California done some different things to kind of try to rein in tech companies. Will he go harder on that and, and try to do that? But that, that's where we're going to see the rubber hit the road in the next couple of years if he is going to try to go national. And so you don't think we're going to be seeing a budget surplus like we did this last year of $100 billion? No, for there's next no more snowflakes going public. There's no more, like, <laughs> there, there, that money is not coming in, right? And, and like I said, great on Elon Musk for dumping $44 billion here. You know, those yeah, those those yeah. employees and executives <laughs> over at Twitter are going to have to pay taxes on that money. Um, even though he moved Tesla's headquarters to Texas, he's still dumping money into California, so thank you. Um, <laughs> but there isn't as much of that money flowing into California right now, and we will feel that down the road. Right so now we're doing ways? fine, but, but. Yeah, how do you think we're gonna feel that, Jeremy and Carla? Mm -hmm. I, I think, well, go ahead. Go yeah, on, go I on. mean, I think, look, Gavin Newsom is very much aware of, of the economic situation and the, and those kitchen table issues when you're talking about gas prices, inflation. He's going to have to deal with housing and homelessness, crime issues. This is where the Republicans have made inroads. He's very much aware of that. And, and you're absolutely right, Jeremy. Those are going to be his challenges as you go forward. But going toward 2024, you got to watch that space with him and watch Kamala Harris as well. 
uh, when you talk about the next generation of Democratic leaders and what happens if Joe with Joe Biden. I think all of this is going to be up in the air. Yeah, we'll Economy be looking for what he center. does, with, what, where the jobs market goes from here. Mm -hmm. if, if the job market falls apart, our economy is not going to be doing well and it's not going to look good on anybody. All right. Jeremy Owens with Market Watch here in San Francisco, Carla Marinucci, political reporter, <laughs> veteran extraordinaire. Thank you both Thank you. for being here. And Carla, welcome back from okay. your sabbatical. Thank you. Thanks, Rita. On Tuesday, the Bay Area was shaken by a 5.1 magnitude earthquake outside of San Jose. The quake came just a few days after the anniversary of the 1989 Loma Prieta earthquake. Many Bay Area residents received advanced warnings right on their smartphones through the MyShake app. The app was created by the Berkeley Seismology Lab, and it's designed to alert users of an earthquake before they feel it. Joining me now to discuss the app, how it works, and its benefits is its creator, the director of the Seismology Lab at UC Berkeley, Professor Richard Allen. Professor Allen, thank you for joining us. My pleasure. All right, so tell us right now how you see the level of earthquake danger in California. Yeah, I mean, we have to be very concerned about a coming earthquake. We know we're gonna have an earthquake. When we think about the likelihood of earthquakes on the major faults throughout the Bay Area, we're talking about a two in three chance in the next 30 years. So this is a reality that we all have to be ready for. And we are overdue for a major quake, aren't we? That's right, well, I like to think about the Haywood fault as it runs right across the Berkeley campus. Mm. And the Haywood fault, we see that the average recurrence interval is about 150 years. The last earthquake was in 1868. So just on pure face value, we are overdue. But at the same time, it's important to recognize that that earthquake may not come for a few years or even a decade. So we have to be ready for the earthquake today, but it may not come for a few years. But it sounds like you're saying within a decade, we are going to have a major quake here in California, in Northern California. That's right. I mean, there are no guarantees, but yes, we should expect to have a big earthquake this decade. We should all be thinking about what are we going to do when that earthquake happens, because there's a very good chance it's going to be in our lifetime. What would an earthquake like that do? What sort of damage? So we shouldn't think of the magnitude 5.1 that we had earlier this week as an example. Mm -hmm. That was a five magnitude 5 earthquake. The magnitude scale is about order of magnitude. So we have to be ready for a magnitude 7. So a magnitude 6 earthquake is 10 times as much shaking. A magnitude as 7 a five. as a 5. Mm -hmm. And a magnitude 7 is 100 times as much shaking as we felt on Tuesday. So we shouldn't be thinking about Tuesday's earthquake as what to expect. We have to expect much stronger shaking there will be damage and there'll be damage across much of the Bay Area. What sort of damage will that be? Is that bridges, other infrastructure I'm assuming? Would BART have trouble? Well yeah, we would expect a lot of sort of distributed damage. The truth is we've done a good job of building buildings and building our infrastructure, our highways to withstand earthquakes. So we're in a much better shape than we were for example in the Loma Prieta earthquake. People have put in a lot of effort. But we should still expect damage to buildings, damage to some of our homes, damage to some of our office buildings. So this is where we should all ask, have we done what we need to do to protect ourselves in our homes and also in our offices. And your piece of this is that you are trying to make sure that people have as much advance notice as possible. So tell us about the MyShake app, which was an alert that many people here in the Bay Area managed to get just seconds before the earthquake hit on Tuesday, but it gave them a little bit of time. Exactly. So on Tuesday, people had up to about 18 seconds of warning between when they got the alert on the app and when they felt the shaking. Enough time to drop, cover, and hold on. Mm -hmm. So how do we do this? The, the app, in this case, it's just the very end of an entire stream of processing. We have seismic stations, so Berkeley runs a network of seismic stations across Northern California, just like the USGS does. Data from those stations come to an algorithm that and we created at Berkeley as well, the EPIC algorithm that generated the alert on Tuesday. That algorithm creates an alert which then gets pushed out to various delivery mechanisms. So the MyShake app is something that everybody can download so they get the warning on their phone. But also if you have an Android phone, it actually is built into Android phones. So every Android phone got the alert on Tuesday as well. Really? And Android phones, you also are able to use them to measure earthquake activity in That's various right. places around the world. That's right. So everybody's phone has an accelerometer in it, which is what allows it to see whether it's in portrait mode or in landscape mode. Mm -hmm. and so we use that accelerometer to detect earthquakes as well. So the MyShake app does that, it records earthquakes and we use that for research. But also within Android, they're now using it within the entire Android ecosystem. So in fact, all phones around the globe are actually detecting earthquakes today. And the Android early warning system is delivering alerts in many countries around the world. 
What are you doing with that data? Is it all coming back into your lab? So the Android data, of course, is, um, is, is handled by Google, and there's a lot of privacy policy issues that mm -hmm. make sure that that data stays very secure. But the MyShake app also collects the data, and so we're using the MyShake data for research to understand how the buildings shake, how our infrastructure shakes during these earthquakes. For the first time, we have accelerometers embedded in our, our the society and the buildings that we live in, so we can much better understand how earthquakes actually affects us as individuals. You didn't grow up here in California where we're used to earthquakes. How did you end up running an earthquake lab, a <laughs> seismology lab at Berkeley? That's right. So I grew up in the UK where there's not very many earthquakes, mm -hmm. but I got very interested in geology and structure of the earth. And then as my career progressed, I became very interested in earthquakes and just the impact it has on our society. And so being here at Berkeley working on the earthquake problem, we have the ability to do our science and also look at the, impact, the impacts it has on society to reduce those impacts. You talked a little bit earlier about how we have been doing more in recent years to prepare for earthquakes, to make our buildings more foundationally secure. What more do we need to do? Where are we lacking here in the Bay? Yeah, no, we have done a great deal. We know how to build buildings today that should not collapse in earthquakes. However, the problem we have is that we have many old buildings, and so that's where the real challenge um, is, is making sure that those older buildings are either retrofitted or replaced by new buildings that we expect to withstand the shaking in the future. Is there enough being done on that front? I mean, do you feel like if the big one happened tomorrow that we've done everything we could and we're in good shape? Or is there something you'd say urgently, right. we need to take this action? Yeah, no, no, we, we haven't done everything we could. The, the real concern is the things like soft story buildings. These are apartment buildings where there's parking garages on the ground floor. City of San Francisco and City of Berkeley is now are actually trying to do something about that to have those retrofitted. We have to look at brick masonry buildings, things like that. That's when the masonry, the bricks, fall off the building onto the street and can injure a lot of people. So it's about going building by building. And that's where our own responsibility comes in. We can ask the question about where we live and where we work. Are those buildings safe? And we can put pressure on the owners of those buildings to make them safer. That all costs money. I mean, retrofitting a building is not an inexpensive venture. Is there support? Is there government funding? Or are there other monies out there? Right. No, this is something where we do need to provide the right kind of incentives for people to, to do this. This is where, unfortunately, Unfortunately, it comes down to individuals to be saying, I don't want to rent this, this property, I don't want to rent this apartment because it's not safe to put the pressure onto the landlords. So you're really advocating for an individual um, power moment here to be able to step up and say there's a problem here and we're not going to stand for it. That's right. All of us individually have to take responsibility for this and I think if we all do this then we really have some power to have some impact. That's right. What else do people need to do individually to be ready? Yeah, so we should all know what we're going to do when there's an earthquake. We should drop, cover and hold on. It doesn't matter whether you got the warning or whether you feel shaking, you drop, cover and hold on. And the reason is very simple. In the Loma Prieta earthquake and the Northridge earthquake about 50% of the injuries were because people fell over or something fell on people. So if you drop, cover, hold on, we just reduce the number of injuries by a very significant number. The second thing to do is what am I going to do next? How am I going to meet up with my family? Where am I going to find my kids? And so how am I going to find my way home? And so that's the other thing within the MyShake app is it actually shows a map of the damage. So this is something we realized people really wanted to know after an earthquake is how do I get home? Where is the damage? Well in the MyShake app you can report the damage and then you can see a map of where that damage is and figure out where you're going to go next. And then when you get home, of course, you need to have a kit. You need to have a kit that sort of that will give you the water and the food that you need for a few days, sort of three to five days is what people typically um, want to prepare for. So those are helpful tips. Tell us about the future of earthquake science. Where do you go from here? Well, we're very fortunate that the Governor's Office of Emergency Services is funding MyShake so that we can actually deliver all of these alerts to people across California. But also we can use the data to do a better job of improving the alerts in the future. And we very much hope that we'll be able to enhance what we're doing by actually recording the data and understanding how the ground motion moves through the urban environment thanks to their support. All right, Professor Richard Allen, thank you so much. My pleasure. We move now from the Earth to the skies. 100 years ago, air travel was just taking off. The Boeing School of Aeronautics opened in 1929 at the Oakland Airport to compete with flight schools in Southern California. The school has since been transformed into the Oakland Museum of Aviation to preserve the East Bay's history of flight. And it's tonight's Something Beautiful. <laughs>
Did you catch that peek at Amelia Earhart? I loved seeing her photos. That is the end of our show for tonight. You can find KQED Newsroom online or on Twitter, or email us at knr at kqed.org. You can always reach me on social media at Priya D. Clemens. Thank you for joining us. We will see you right back here next Friday night. Have a great weekend. Thank you.